talk uh, or flagship online webinar series where we invite members, stakeholders, friends of Eurocommerce, EU institutions and media to listen in and engage on policy discussions that are very important for retail and wholesale. And we do that with a senior uh, EU politicians or a leader of our industry. We have several hundred uh, registered participants today and I consider this as a success already, but it is also a testimony to the speaker we have on the policy talk today. We are indeed very pleased to welcome Commissioner Margrethe Vestager as our guest. I don't think she needs any introduction, but in case you've just arrived in Brussels, uh, here's a little recap. A former Minister of Education, Economy and Interior in the Danish government and a member of the Danish parliament for almost 15 years. She arrived in Brussels as competition commissioner in 2014 and very quickly became the star and powerful woman of the Juncker Commission. She was reappointed by the Danish government uh, for a second mandate and named by Ursula von der Leyen as executive vice president of the European Commission for a Europe fit for the digital age. And what everyone has been able to observe is over the past seven years is uh, someone with clear and straight mind with, I would say, political courage, not afraid of tackling major vested interest and combining a strong belief for fairness with a liberal mind to stimulate entrepreneurship. For Eurocommerce, she is a key commissioner. Retailers and wholesalers compete every day for customers. They need competitive supply chain, they need a properly functioning single market, and they need a level playing field when it comes to competition. And the rapidly changing digital environment has created increased transparency for consumers. But it also has also opened up completely new sales channels for many players, platforms, manufacturers to sell direct to EU consumers online and also increased competition from outside the EU. So we see a real need for competition rule to reflect those fundamental changes. So we here are we today uh, to talk about all these issues about competition policies and this is ranged from the legislation on vertical and horizontal block exemptions, about state aid, about discriminatory anti-competitive legislation in some countries, about fragmentation of the single markets by manufacturers that prevent um, the creation of a single market for sourcing, potentially by in also interchange fee charged by card companies. We are here to talk about recovery. We're here to talk about omni-channel retail and wholesale. We're here also to talk about uh, competition in the agriculture and food supply chain. A lot to talk about, certainly stuff for, we could have you know weekly workshops for about four hours with that, uh, but we know we won't have that time. So true to the, um, the format that we use, I will uh, give the floor now to, uh, to you, uh, uh, Commissioner Vester, for introductory remark for as long as you see fit. But, um, and then we'll have uh, sessions of Q&A and I'll bring in my colleague Christelle Delberg, who will be uh, uh, raising and, uh, and curating the question uh, to you. Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think I am unmuted now yes um, actually it's is is not far-fetched what you say because we have a very good corporation uh, it may not be weekly webinars but um, but it is a really good corporation I really appreciate uh, your engagement but let me begin by thanking you it's generous of you to have this event today but that is not what I'm hinting at I want to thank every retailer in the European Union, every, every wholesaler, every distributor, every agent. Um, it has been a year since COVID-19 began its uh, spread uh, throughout Europe. Uh, in that time, uh, some of you have faced uh, closure, some of you have faced disruptions, uh, all of you have faced radical change uh, as to how to do business. You have seen a completely new role for government, uh, for the state in each and every uh, member state. But because you showed up for work, making the necessary changes to keep staff, to keep consumers safe, 
Well, we have food uh, on the shelves. Uh, we have essential supplies uh, available with remarkably few um, uh, disruptions, uh, given the scale uh, of the emergency that we have faced. I, I really don't think that it's an exaggeration uh, to say that without the resilience shown in the retail and the wholesale sector, uh, we would not have gone through this year uh, as well as we did, uh, despite of everything. Of course, saying thank you uh, is one thing. Uh, creating a policy environment that supports your sector in the face of such radical change, well, that's quite another thing. Uh, and these are the things that, that we will uh, discuss today. Uh, and in, do, in, in doing so, I think it's, it, it may be a good thing to take a step back and look at what has happened the, the last 12 months. Uh, one of the big lessons has been how well the single market has proven uh, to be. It has proven itself. It is, it is strong, uh, also in the face of such uh, disruption. Uh, continuity of, uh, of supply has been the rule, uh, not the exceptions. The, the problems have been solved, and all of this because of the fundamental that competitive markets, they are robust. Uh, protecting the, the single market, that has been the objective uh, behind the temporary framework uh, for state aid. And it has uh, enabled member states to provide support for uh, businesses, much needed support for businesses, but with uh, conditions that apply horizontally in all member states. Uh, the sums involved, uh, they are uh, really uh, considerable. Uh, in total, we have approved a budget of three trillions of euros uh, in support. Uh, all aid uh, proved necessary and uh, proportionate. Uh, still, of course, given the large um, disparities between member states, understandably, it has raised some concerns uh, worries about the unleveling uh, of the playing field uh, in, and a quite asymmetric uh, recovery. Uh, but budgets, budgets are not the same as spending. Uh, and that is why uh, my services launched a survey uh, to see well, what has actually happened uh, on ground. How did member states uh, actually spend uh, in, in the different schemes? And the replies show that about half a trillion in aid uh, was dispersed uh, within the union uh, from the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic uh, till uh, end of September. That is give or take uh, three and a half percent of, uh, of GDP. At country level, we are not seeing uh, member states uh, disproportionately uh, outspending their, their peers. Uh, nor are we seeing uh, aid um, that would be disproportionate uh, to the economic damage uh, that uh, we have all suffered. Uh, implementation is, um, is picking up steadily, uh, also in the member states who are uh, the most affected uh, in the second wave of uh, COVID. That, of course, is really good to see. Uh, obviously, we will keep uh, monitoring this. Uh, we now also have a clear path uh, for uh, recovery. Uh, the European recovery plan is designed uh, su to support the process uh, without, uh, with uh, an unprecedented uh, financial uh, leverage. An envelope of 750 billion euros. Uh, but this plan is about so much more than money, because what we are setting out to do is to uh, recover while steering Europe uh, towards our, our twin transitions, the digital uh, and the green one. So we do not just want to, to recover, we want to build a, a better, a more sustainable and a more digital uh, economy than the one we had uh, back in 2019. Of course, we have no illusions here uh, in the Commission. Uh, public sector support, no matter how well conceived, no matter how well it is set up, uh, that will only do what it says. It will support the broader economy. Uh, Europe's uh, recovery mainly depends on uh, Europe's businesses. 
it is uh, the the women and the men uh, who works uh, in the business uh, community uh, who makes a difference here. Our role is to uh, provide and maintain a sound uh, legal and, and regulatory framework for you, private sector, uh, to get on uh, with the job that you do. So the first thing that we have to look out for is the risk that uh, funding under the recovery plan harms the single market. Uh, the best way to do this uh, is to make sure that um, that this uh, doesn't happen. Um, yeah, well, we we need we want to provide guidance uh, to member states uh, to ensure that they are still in compliance uh, with state aid rules, to assess uh, the notifications uh, under the recovery plan as a, as a matter of priority. And of course, this is our promise to member states and, and to the uh, private sector. Uh, we have made uh, 13 different uh, guiding uh, templates to enable uh, member states to assess um, what they can do without calling the commission, what they can do with notifying the commission, and what will then enable really fast uh, notifications. But the second thing is that also in the recovery, we will um, rigorously uh, enforce uh, competition rules. Uh, earlier this year, we op opened um, uh, an in investigation into the practices of Mondelez uh, to, inv to, to investigate whether they restricted parallel uh, trade in the market for biscuits, uh, chocolate and coffee, to the detriment, of course, uh, of consumers in a number of countries. Uh, because the power of the single market is its openness. Uh, and that is what brings choice, that is what brings lower prices. Uh, and as you have alluded to in, in, in some of the questions that has reached me um, ahead of, uh, of our event today, there may be scope for further uh, enforcement uh, where suppliers abuse uh, a position of, uh, of dominance uh, as a result of, um, of the changes brought uh, about by e-commerce. Uh, in any case, we are here uh, to react uh, because for the recovery to be fast and strong, uh, of course, uh, we need uh, competition law enforcement to be part of it. Uh, we are also being uh, proactive. Uh, E-commerce uh, growth of online platforms is a big uh, part of uh, updating and complementing uh, our competition rules. Uh, the rules on vertical uh, agreements, uh, vertical block exemption regulation and the vertical guidelines, uh, they have to reflect uh, this new reality uh, while, of course, giving the clearest possible indication as to how, um, how market player, two market players uh, on how their vertical agreements is compliant uh, with the law. Uh, and in the wake of the COVID crisis, uh, and as, as we all know, that has increased online sales uh, beyond belief, um, we must make sure that also investment in, uh, in brick and mortar sto stores are not uh, discouraged so that consumers continue to have a choice, uh, not only between uh, online channels, but also whether to buy uh, online or offline. This review is still ongoing. Uh, I look very much forward uh, also to your feedback uh, to the public consultation. Uh, we plan to, to release the draft uh, in May. Also, the rules of horizontal agreements are under review. And here, uh, too, digitization is a very important scheme, uh, part of, uh, of, the, of the theme, uh, part of why we think that change is needed. Uh, also here, we really welcome uh, the input uh, for the different chapters or of the horizontal uh, guidelines. Uh, I refer to, to, point, uh, to joint uh, purchasing, uh, to retail uh, alliances uh, in particular. Uh, of course, uh, we, I would, uh, as anyone benefits the, or, or welcome uh, the benefits that such alliances can bring to consumers that be more choices, uh, more affordable um, uh, prices uh, to promote uh, also uh, innovation uh, in products uh, upstream. Obviously, at the same time, we would want to keep a very careful eye on such uh, alliances as to uh, how they work in practice. Uh, 
uh, because proof of the pudding is in the eating. Uh, we would want alliances to do what they claim to do, lower prices, innovation, more choice, rather than being a cover uh, for cartel uh, behavior. And it is, I think, clear that these rules, um, they are not uh, up to date uh, regarding the possibilities of uh, information exchange in, in the digital era. So we recognize the need to clarify and, uh, and update uh, the text of those chapters uh, as well. And it's really important uh, that you help us doing so uh, with your input. Uh, we also have, um, um, have called upon uh, regulation sort of in a wider uh, context uh, to complement uh, vigilant uh, competition law enforcement. And, uh, and that we have done in the Digital Markets Act. Uh, it targets a, a small uh, group or uh, circle of, uh, of large companies uh, if they act as gatekeepers. Um, by setting out uh, sort of ex ante what we expect of them uh, and that what we will uh, not tolerate, uh, we want to build an online market that is open, uh, that is fair, uh, that allows for um, all kinds of businesses to enable uh, consumer choice. Uh, and of course, by that also enabling businesses uh, to scale up. Uh, we want transparency for the intermediation inter services uh, when it comes to online uh, advertising, uh, something uh, that could lower costs uh, for companies uh, who advertise uh, on platforms and in turn, uh, hopefully also lead to lower prices on the goods uh, that are being uh, advertised. Uh, making competition uh, fit for uh, the digital uh, decade is just uh, one way uh, of how we are preparing for the transition. In parallel, we are proposing a Digital Services Act uh, that will, will stir up uh, our fight uh, against products uh, that do not live up uh, to, to what they were supposed uh, to live up to. They could be unsafe, they could be fake. Um, not only um, such practices is a big problem for consumers, but obviously for the many, 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 many businesses who play by the rule book, uh, it is a problem if you're fa faced with, uh, with unfair competition uh, with businesses who not uh, play by the rule book. So, uh, so that, of course, we hope uh, for the Parliament uh, and the Council to pass as fast as possible, because we have a sense of urgency when it comes uh, also to, to these elements. Um, one of the things that we would also want to encourage is better data sharing. Um, we think that now, uh, sort of the next big chapter of digitization is beginning with the digitization of industry, of all the different sectors, uh, of retail, of wholesale, you know, you name it, it's about uh, data. So uh, we would want uh, uh, to, to enable that key information can get uh, to, to you as players, uh, also as a source of, uh, of innovation, uh, no matter where you are in, in the value chain. Uh, the European Payments uh, Initiative, uh, I think, is an example, another example uh, of how digital can help uh, the sector uh, by creating pan-European uh, payment solutions, uh, building on the SEPA uh, architecture. Uh, I think there is a possibility of, uh, of substantial cost savings to merchants, uh, as well, of course, as convenience uh, to shoppers. Uh, I'm also aware uh, of your concerns on how increasing fees and international cards uh, schemes are impacting the charges paid uh, by merchants. Uh, and we want to make sure that the, the savings uh, from the uh, interchange fee regulations are not being eroded uh, over time, uh, which is something that we're looking into uh, as part of monitoring uh, the regulation and obviously uh, Anything you want to tell us about that it's working or not, we're more than happy to hear. Um, last but not least, as said, this is a twin transition. Uh, so I'm really happy to see that today's event also cover uh, sustainability. We, um, we want to deliver on the many, many promises uh, given, uh, for example, under the Green Deal or, or the Farm to Fork uh, initiative. 
if we are to deliver on those uh, promises, everyone, of course, will have to do their part. Otherwise, not going to happen. Uh, we are in the process of revising the energy and environmental um, uh, protection state aid guidelines. Uh, we want to make them fit for purpose, uh, for, for decarbonizing, uh, in order for this to complement uh, the targets made uh, under the climate uh, legislation. Uh, part of that, uh, of course, is fostering awareness. It's not all just uh, regulation. Uh, in our working methods uh, and the choices uh, we make as consumers, um, the changes that each and every one of us will do will add up uh, to big reductions, both in, in waste, in emissions, uh, enabling uh, circularity in the economy. And uh, when changes like this is needed, uh, well, the first thing, of course, is to make sure that rules are well understood. If they are not understood, of course, they're not used, they're not implemented. It's not a real thing for, for consumers or, or the sector. And this is uh, one of the things, of course, for you to know is when to and how to uh, join efforts uh, in doing research to produce, uh, commercialize uh, products, uh, or if necessary, to set uh, industry standards. Uh, this sort of cooperation is not necessarily uh, prohibited. Uh, in fact, uh, it can lead to cost savings uh, that would benefit uh, consumers. It can help to spur innovation. It can generate um, the kinds of synergies uh, between competitiveness and sustainability, uh, exactly what we think about when we talk about the twin transitions. Um, I, that being said, uh, I also want to sound a, a note of, uh, of caution. Uh, there is a risk that uh, that sort of uh, sustainability or fake sustainability is being used as uh, as a cloak for for undermining uh, the market economy uh, as we know it. Uh, sort of um, green protectionism uh, that may seem uh, appealing, uh, ultimately, of course, self defeating because if we weaken the single market, well, the benefits. Of, uh, of tackling um, uh, excessive use of resources, uh, emissions, uh, what have you, of course, they will not travel as far as they should. Uh, competition will not enable innovation when it comes to green, and that will then, of course, pull us backwards. Um, there are uh, also ideas to create new derogations uh, from competition rules for agriculture. Uh, simply put, uh, farmers prosperity, their resilience, well, that depends on functioning uh, open markets, not on uh, fixing quotas uh, and prices. Uh, and this is, of course, not something that we think. This is something that we know uh, from practice. Uh, we also know what can work well in order to balance um, the different uh, negotiating power in this really important value chain um, uh, from, from farm uh, to fork. Basically, just to conclude, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've been, been learning uh, during this crisis, uh, not to take resilience for granted. Uh, your sector has shown remarkable resilience, uh, precisely because it's built on a, a very strong uh, foundation, and that is a foundation by, um, by retailers, wholesalers, uh, to provide uh, what is needed. Uh, what you have done to make uh, people who, who work in this sector safe, for consumers uh, to be safe and to feel safe, uh, I think that is, that is remarkable. And, and supporting that resi resilience, uh, safeguarding strong and competitive, uh, fair and open markets. Well, that's, of course, I hope is the best possible way to say thank you uh, for all that you have done. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Margrethe, for uh, for this uh, kind words and um, and also for uh, for really having um, going through the major review of all the uh, of all the key issues. Um, as we said, uh, there is you know pl plenty of, of material and, and time to to debate with you. But without further ado, I'll, I'll call upon Christelle Delbeck, who is our 
executive director for, for competitiveness and, and communication covers a lot of the um, all the portfolio of, of issues dealing with you so uh, and I think we've received many questions from uh, people as you as you know as you alluded to as well so she's going to try to organize that in in sort of three mini sessions uh, you know per theme so Christelle over to you thank you thank you very much um, uh, executive vice president for uh, your appreciation of the role of the retail and wholesale sector uh, throughout the crisis um, and, and for your introductory remarks. Uh, we have received indeed uh, many, many questions from the audience uh, and these will be um, uh, split in uh, basically four groups. Uh, one first block of questions on uh, the recovery and supporting the transition. Uh, then we will take some more questions with regard to digital and competition rules and how to support uh, brick and mortar um, and omnichannel retail and wholesale. Uh, a third group of questions on uh, the agri-food sector, uh, which you have alluded to, and uh, and and last, uh, we will take one 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 or two questions on on the payment uh, payment card schemes. So these are the the, the key blocks of questions that we have uh, received uh, and how we've clustered them. Um, with regard to the recovery and uh, and supporting the transition, I, I mean w once again uh, a big thank you. Uh, uh, for the Commission uh, and the supportive, supportive role in uh, providing uh, state aid and, and guaranteeing um, support throughout the, the, uh, the, the difficult situation that uh, companies have been through and are still going through at the moment. Uh, there's two questions uh, that we have here we'd like to, to ask. Uh, the first one relates to competition rules and, uh, and the recovery uh, and, and, and supporting the transition. And, and the question is, how can the competition rules support the sustainability and the digital transition while ensuring that competition is not distorted and continues to play its vital role as the greatest incentive to innovate? So that's the first one. And the second one relates to access to the funds. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, support under the uh, new generation EU Funds will be substantial and will exceed the thresholds on national state aid to individual companies. So, how will the Commission deal with this? Uh, thank you very much. Um, and indeed, the first question uh, is also a question I've been asking myself. Uh, how can we? Uh, how can we be helpful? Uh, when it comes to to uh, the digital and the twin uh, and the and the green transition, while at the same time maintaining that the fundamentals of competition is is the strongest driver, um, because the, the strongest driver uh, to to innovate to uh, table the best uh, possible uh, solutions is of course uh, competition as such. But it, it may not be enough. Uh, so um, last autumn uh, in September, uh, I launched a, a debate as to how can uh, how can competition law enforcement uh, also enable uh, the green transition. Uh, we had a very strong response uh, to those questions from all sides um, of uh, of this debate, and we had a um, a conference on the fourth of uh, of February. All of that will, of course, feed into how we deal with uh, with the reviews uh, that we are doing right now. Uh, for instance, the the Energy and Environmental Protection Aid uh, guidelines, uh, but also other uh, guidelines if if we see that uh, to be fit. Uh, always, of course, maintaining uh, that we are here to make sure that the single market works as a single market and that it is uh, competitive. Um, we think that there may be uh, a number of, uh, of things to, to do. Um, for us, one of the things that are important is that the rules work for everyone in, in the different value change. Uh, and that, of course, is, is some of the things that will be uh, somewhat uh, tricky. Um, it also goes for, for the digital uh, transition uh, that's uh, interacting with, with stakeholders is, is of the essence. Um, here, you know, it has a, a longer uh, history because I got started already in the last mandate with 
three special advisors um, who carved out uh, what would be the most um, high priority areas uh, to deal with when it comes to, to digital markets as such. As such. And, and part of the response to that you will see in the Digital Markets Act in, 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 in ensuring that if you are successful and you're more than welcome to be successful in the single market, uh, that when that success is, is followed by a market power uh, beyond belief, then uh, there's also a responsibility uh, to be lifted uh, for those who, who have that kind of market power. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, sort of why uh, the gatekeeper uh, concept uh, has been born for this ex ante designation by a commission decision based on objective criteria. So, so we, we are pushing for both, uh, but we're not done with these debates uh, yet. Um, also, because there is there is still uh, some tricky balancing uh, to do uh, when it comes, for instance, to outer market efficiencies. Uh, how should that be dealt with? Uh, and of course, also really recognizing our limits when it comes to green, that um, uh, it is for the legislator uh, to set uh, the framework uh, as to what's uh, to be achieved as, as is the tradition uh, within uh, our sort of uh, legislator, um, that the legislator will, will set uh, the framework for a, a number of these things, like, for instance, the um, the passport for, for products so that they can be followed uh, in the life cycle, uh, that sort of thing. We fully respect that in that, of course, uh, competition law enforcement uh, and the competition rules are a, a kind of a subcontractor. Um, the support uh, on the next generation uh, Europe, uh, it will be substantial, uh, obviously. Uh, as said, uh, the state aid, um, the necessary proportion of state aid uh, paid out so far uh, last year is 3.3% uh, of GDP. Uh, now we're in the process of, um, of preparing uh, the fund for uh, 750 uh, billion euros. And, and of course, this is a centerpiece. Uh, these funds will still have to uh, live up to, to state aid rules for the very simple reason that we want to spend these funds in the best possible way. And we do not want to sacrifice uh, the single market uh, while spending it. Um, obviously, we want a strong and fast recovery uh, to the benefit of business, but also to the benefits of, for instance, young people who are harder hit uh, probably than anyone else uh, here during the pandemic. That, that they can get access to, to the labor market. And that is one of the reasons why we have um, uh, engaged uh, a lot uh, also with colleagues within the Commission uh, to make sure that we can work very fast. Uh, in order to do that, we have made uh, these 13 uh, uh, state aid guiding templates for, for different sectors, uh, those that we think are the most obvious ones, for member states to be able to assess what can I do without um, in involving the Commission as such, which is basically no aid? Uh, where could I use uh, the general block exemption regulation? So I still don't have to call the, the Commission. Uh, I can do things uh, by myself, but it's within sort of the framework of general block exemption regulation. So we know that single market issues are still maintained. And when would I have to call the Commission? And what kind of characteristics of a scheme would then be good uh, in order to have a swift uh, approval uh, of the different schemes in order to be able to move uh, move fast uh, forward, and uh, and we are also part of um, of a, a network of state aid uh, country uh, coordinators uh, that are ready to assist uh, anything that member states uh, might want to to know when it comes to sort of the framework of the recovery and and resilience fund. Um, and one of the things uh, that we work with specifically within the Commission is to make these national uh, recovery and resilience plans have sort of the features of a, of a contract. Um, it's a lot of money uh, that we're borrowing from the next generation. So also those money should be used uh, wisely. And it's the first time we do this. So obviously we would want to prove uh, that it can be done in a very efficient manner. And this is why we're all about targets and milestones. Of course, not too many, not necessarily new, 
but that member states produce a, a benchmark and a target as to what they want to achieve, and between the two, a set of milestones so that progress can actually be measured. Uh, because one thing is to say, I will provide uh, basic digital skills for, for this percentage of my, my population. Uh, well, what percentage exactly, and how will you actually get there? Because we have a very, very short time frame to pull this off. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, really uh, important uh, to us because then the business community will also pick up much faster if the recovery and resilience uh, funds are being used within this quite short uh, window. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Vestager, for uh, this uh, first part of, uh, of the questions. Now turning on to, on to digital. Um, the, uh, the the COVID crisis has shake, uh, and digital have shaken up uh, the retail and wholesale business. A uh, striking Eurostat uh, figure uh, shows that before the crisis, two in three retailers did not have an online sales presence before COVID. Um, what is uh, also happening, so COVID crisis has accelerated online sales and investment in omni-channel omni retail and investments have uh, been, I mean, investments scheduled initially over several years have taken place in just a few months. Platforms have em emerged as enhancing consumer choice, but also as a way for the sellers to reach customers uh, without, without having to set up their online uh, operation. At the same time, what we have uh, also realized in the sector is that major brands have been using uh, digital to impose further restrictions on their resellers, uh, while at the same time investing also in their own direct-to-consumers online sales. And as part of this, restrictions on reselling on third-party platforms have increased also since the COVID judgment. But the impact of those restrictions is all the more dramatic uh, in the current environment where access to brick and mortar shops is being restri restricted by, by governments. And, uh, and the future is still very, very unpre unpredictable for, for many. So the, the key questions that we have had uh, received in that, uh, in, 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 that, in that block or area is the first of one is how will the Commission take account of the massive competitive impact of digital on our sector? A second question is uh, in relation to supporting uh, resilience uh, and omnichannel. So through the COVID crisis, those who did less bad uh, were those who had, on top of their offline operation, had an online operation or were able to set it up quickly. So the question is, how can digital and competition rules help brick and mortar retailers compete successfully online? And can you say a little bit more on the review of the vertical block exemption regulation and, and guidelines and how that will take into account digitalization? Thank you. Thank you. After all these years, one still have to check if muted or not. Um, I think this is a, this is a really high priority uh, area for us. Uh, because what has happened over these last uh, 12 months uh, has changed a lot of habits. Uh, and we also see that not only are businesses doing better if they have uh, both uh, channels, um, but also um, a majority of, uh, of consumers report that they will continue uh, to do part of their shopping uh, online. So, so it is a real uh, change uh, in the marketplace, and that, of course, should be uh, reflected uh, in what we do. Uh, the first thing is, of course, to maintain uh, a leading role when it comes to antitrust uh, enforcement. Uh, we will do uh, everything we can with the tools we have. Um, we have the, the e-sector, um, e-commerce uh, sector in inquiry. Uh, I think that was a good example of, uh, of having an overview of the sector and doing the, the follow-up uh, cases uh, to, 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 um, to make sure that things are right. But also uh, some of the investigation that we do are addressing these things directly. If you look at the statement of objection that we sent uh, uh, in the Amazon case, you know we have the suspicion uh, that uh, data are being used to the benefits of Amazon retail 
dramatically reducing the risks uh, of Amazon retail compared to the risk that any other trader uh, on the platform will have to do not having access uh, to the same type of, uh, of data that are not publicly uh, available data. Uh, so these are, I think, uh, examples uh, of the casework that we, that we are doing. Uh, you probably know as well that we have a couple of Apple investigations, uh, one in the App Store, uh, one specific when it comes to the App Store and one in, in Apple Pay. Uh, we have a Facebook uh, investigation um, on the question of uh, marketplace and the use of data. And we have also a very large investigation uh, into the Google uh, Ads uh, ecosystem. So of course, pushing uh, for this uh, in order to make sure that the marketplace is in, in fair in that respect. Uh, of course, as a second thing, we will use every tool that we have to the fullest. Uh, we now have the sector inquiry uh, into the internet uh, of things. Um, and, uh, and that will, will bring us uh, new insights and knowledge. Uh, and we will uh, also um, use the, the intermediate measures tool uh, if we find uh, any cases where this would be appropriate. Uh, you know, the, the bar that we have to use it is, uh, is quite uh, uh, high uh, because the bar will have to be uh, irreparable uh, harm or, or damage. But of course, uh, we have put this table, this uh, tool, uh, out there uh, ready for use. Uh, so if we have candidates, uh, obviously uh, we will do it. Uh, third, uh, as said, uh, we're looking into uh, whether our rules are fit for purpose. Uh, because as markets change, uh, so will uh, the rules in order to secure the fundamentals, uh, which is uh, fair uh, competition. So we are reviewing uh, the safe harbor and, uh, and the guidelines for, for vertical and horizontal agreement as set. Uh, but we are also uh, evaluating the notice of, um, on market definition. Uh, and here, uh, as I said, we're very happy with, um, with Eurocommerce uh, involvement uh, in all the public consultations uh, that we do. Uh, in the context of the review of the uh, vertical block exemption regulation and the, and the vertical guidelines, uh, the main findings was that on the one hand side, uh, these rules are, are useful, they serve a very good uh, purpose, uh, but also that there is room for improvements uh, because of the digitization of uh, our markets. Uh, so in particular, where uh, legal certainty uh, would improve, um, we would want to, to, um, to make sure that we adapt uh, to recent market developments uh, so that, that you know uh, what, what uh, to do and, uh, and what not to do. And, uh, and one of the things is obviously, as also mentioned uh, in the introduction here, uh, the seamless so, sort of uh, omni-channel uh, experience. Uh, these are, are impacts that we will take into consideration, of course, enforced, uh, in, enhanced uh, by the, the pandemic. Um, the evaluation of the horizontal block exemption regulation and, and guidelines. Uh, here we are looking in particular into the chapters on, on joint uh, purchasing and uh, information exchange uh, for better to, to reflect uh, today's uh, realities. Um, you will know this uh, so much uh, better uh, and, and, and it is a balance because uh, we see that both uh, joint purchasing and retail alliances can bring uh, efficiencies that can result in lower prices, more consumer choice, uh, more product uh, innovation uh, upstream uh, and choices. Uh, but it is a balance uh, because obviously we don't want this uh, to, to stifle competition. We don't want it to glide into to cartel uh, behavior uh, because if, if that balance is maintained, there will still be sort of a competitive drive uh, for investment uh, and innovation. And obviously uh, that is very important uh, for us. Uh, for information exchange, uh, we see, uh, as because also because you, you, you tell us uh, about it quite a lot, uh, digitization has brought about a, a new range of, po of uh, possibilities uh, when it comes to uh, data sharing, uh, data pooling, uh, and we should ensure that guidance uh, is out there, uh, allowing um, stakeholders uh, like you to self-assess 
uh, what you're doing uh, in order to be effective uh, in using data. Um, the same uh, sort of market uh, change also influences how we see the notice of, uh, of the market definition. Um, it will, the review will, will hopefully uh, enable uh, everyone to see uh, what it is that, that we do. I think part of uh, what we see in the evaluation is that the, the fundamental principles, uh, they are fine. Uh, you know, uh, it's one of the fundamentals that, that a market stretches as far as, uh, as customers still will have someone else to turn to. Um, but that being said, uh, markets are still changing and market characteristics uh, are changing uh, because of, uh, of the digitization. Uh, last but uh, not least, uh, as said, uh, we want to complement uh, our competition law enforcement, uh, our guidelines uh, with uh, regulatory measures. And one of the things of the Digital Markets Act, uh, of course, is that uh, it is aimed at taking a number of the insights that we have from our casework uh, and then make sure that this is now uh, more a, a general uh, rule so that those who are designated as gatekeepers will have these do's and these don'ts uh, to deal with. And that, of course, should also enable uh, that the marketplace uh, will open uh, up. Uh, as said, and, and one of the interesting things in, in this line of work is, of course, that we came from a situation where e-commerce was the thing growing uh, that needed uh, to have space to develop. Now we are really uh, aware uh, of the need to enable incentive uh, also to invest in, in brick and mortar uh, because the omni-channel um, perspective and the consumer choice is of the essence. Okay, that, thank you very much. I see the time is flying. I think you said you might have a little bit of flexibility. Can I ask, is, can I use maybe 10 more minutes beyond the 11.30 if that's possible for you? Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, so that make sure we can go through all the questions because it's very, very interesting. Christelle. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we could go on uh, in uh, uh, with the co conversation in, in relation to digital and, and, and the DMA. Uh, but I'd like now to switch more to, towards the agri-food chain. You have alluded to uh, the impact of uh, alliances, um, joint purchasing agreements and uh, their potential benefits in terms of consumer choice um, and, uh, and, and prices. Um, so, so, so that is something that uh, a message that we warmly welcome uh, from your side. Um, we we are also under pressure, and you have alluded to that as well in your opening speech uh, by uh, the by manufacturers that are of large brand products that are fragmenting the single market. A recent study by DG Grow. Um, shows that it is a reality, uh, single market fragmentation is a reality and creates a significant significant consumer harm. Um, the estimation in the consumer package goods uh, sector is 14 billion euros at least. Uh, so that is not a tiny amount, it is a, a real problem. Um, can I, uh, so, so the questions in relation to this uh, is how do you consider the best way to ensure the right balance across the supply chain? Um, is there a case to put even more resources in enforcement to ensure that the single market uh, works? And in particular, that retailers and wholesalers in Europe can benefit from the single market for their sourcing. And the third question uh, on the agri-food chain relates to agriculture. So the significant, uh, the most significant part of agricultural production, um, Food Drink Europe says about 70% of agricultural production goes to the processing industry. Hmm. And within that uh, processing industry, large brand manufacturers enjoy net margins of 15 to 30%, while our sector, retail and wholesale, makes uh, margins of, net margins of in the range of one to 3%. Farmers' income, is a real challenge um, and uh, it, it, it is a real real challenge and the European Parliament these days is pressing for more scope for farmers to cooperate on uh, quantities and prices and in relation to the agriculture or agri-food supply chain then the question is how can competition rules help farmers take advantage of the market support farmers joint activities 
but at the same time ensuring that this remains a competitive market. Mm. Thank you. This is um, this is something that we will need to to revisit um, uh, over and uh, and over again because there is no sort of magic formula uh, to to define the right uh, balance here. Um, we we will indeed um, not only be be uh, having an open door for for complaints and, and information, but we will also uh, look at the market in in close cooperation with uh, national competition authorities, uh, because one could think that everything about di is about digital digital, but uh, but no uh, things that are uh, important here when it comes to the relationship between uh retail and, and and wholesale as said when we did the e-commerce uh sector inquiry uh, remains of course important to us uh it is really uh close to the the consumer uh, it is something that we want to do if we find cases and as said we just open in the in the Mondelez uh case um we see different ways of uh of uh, addressing this as said uh we think that alliances uh, can be a good thing uh, being very careful, uh, of course, even though we want vigilant competition law enforcement uh, not to see a, a cartel or a potential cartel in, in every alliance, um, because we see that uh, that they can actually uh, be very helpful uh, for consumers. Uh, in, in particular, when, when members of the alliance uh, face uh, suppliers with, uh, with a strong uh, market position, which can very often be the case in retail, uh, as just uh, said, with the with the different uh, margins uh, here. So uh, I, I think that is uh, that is the important uh, point here. The question of of uh, the relationship in in sort of the farm to fork uh, uh, value chain is also something that we keep revisiting. Uh, also in the last mandate, the European Parliament uh, addressed uh, these questions, and and we continue to to collect. Um, data uh, to support what actually works uh, because it is uh, really difficult for uh, many of the very very small or smaller farmers uh, to sustain uh, and to have a, a reasonable uh, income and what we saw and uh, and have uh, i think based on facts uh, now several times is that um, farmers uh, collaboration within uh, producer organizations or cooperatives uh, they can address a number of the challenges uh, that farmers uh, are faced with, uh, and they are in particular helpful if farmers uh, come together uh, for storage, for transport, uh, for things that can enhance uh, and maintain the quality uh, of the produce. Um, what we do not see uh, is that uh, quotas or, or price fixing uh, as such uh, is the help. Um, it is it is uh, when they come together uh, to do things in common like storage, um, processing, transport, uh, things that improve the quality that the bargaining uh, position is improving, uh, and that uh, ought to be uh, what we achieved. Um, we have specific derogation from competition rules that allows uh, for farmers um, uh, to do such cooperation uh, and. I think that is uh, that is perfectly fine, uh, as long as we have the transparency as as to what is happening, uh, because it, uh, as you can see, with the, the interest of the European Parliament, uh, it is something that uh, everyone is is preoccupied with. Uh, I think we will come back to it uh, again, uh, because as I said, uh, there is no magic formula as how to make sure that the bargaining uh, negotiating power in that value chain. Uh, is fully balanced. Uh, of course, here uh, with the revisions that we do, more than happy uh, to hear your comments uh, when it comes to to the guidelines, uh, if that is helpful to you. Thank you uh, for these uh, helpful remarks on on on, on the agri food chain. Uh, we now have a last question from the audience uh, uh, that is in relation to to card card schemes. So again, uh, one area, uh, another area where competition 
is uh, is uh, not necessarily fully functional. And the question is uh, the, uh, the the following. So competition to the two US-based global card companies is still three, five years away. How can the commission address the massive rises in card schemes fees since the review of the interchange fee regulation, which have canceled out the benefits to merchants of the caps under the IFR? Well, I think the, the most obvious uh, thing to say here is that we are really happy with, uh, with the contact uh, with Eurocommerce uh, regarding uh, these increases um, because uh, there is an impact of the scheme fee uh, increases uh, by international card schemes on, on charges paid by merchants. Um, we, we see that uh, and we're very uh, happy with, uh, with the evidence uh, that you have provided. Uh, so we will obviously look into this. Uh, and, and that comes from, from a background of having uh, followed uh, and evaluated um, um, the, the, the scheme that is basically uh, the background for all of this, uh, the interchange uh, fee regulation. Uh, we were quite happy with the way that it works uh, in general. Uh, that was what the evaluation showed. So we find that it is too early to decide on a need for a, a legislative review uh, as such, uh, because it has enhanced uh, market uh, integration. It has reduced um, uh, merchant uh, charges uh, as well. And because of that, I think also reduced, uh, enabled better services to consumers. But uh, one thing is that the regulation as such works. Uh, it's a different thing uh, uh, to see the, the possible uh, scheme fees increases uh, that has come about uh, the last uh, couple of years uh, and increasingly so. Uh, so that is something that we will definitely uh, look into and, uh, and we are very happy uh, with the cooperation uh, and the evidence uh, and the facts uh, provided by you because it is a priority. I know it may not be something that uh, sort of the end consumers uh, considers, but for us, uh, the payment uh, options and the payment schemes are really important. And of course, we follow very closely also what happens uh, with further payment services uh, brought about by innovation uh, enabled by digitization. So, so thank you very much uh, for the engagement here and we will definitely do what we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Okay, well, no, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, on, on uh, and certainly on that last point. I mean, we're very glad to see uh, a, sort of a, a heightened level of, of awareness, uh, at least in your mind, because it is true that we have uh, been indeed a bit uh, a bit frustrated over the last couple of years uh, by uh, you know a bit of lack of action by by your services in that. I think the study. Uh, indeed, by Ernst and Young was uh, was was sort of completed uh, uh, was finished in in sort of 2018, and we saw we saw spikes in 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 fees coming after that. Um, and I think we've provided that evidence, I think, to you, um, and, and we see really a clear circumvention of the intention and and the letter of the of the of the inter interchange fee regulation, which we saw as a as a major success, you know, by the commission, um, you know, after after the court cases several years ago. So I think it is important that we 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 remain vigilant. Um, and and I mean, you only have to. I mean, Christelle alluded to uh, to margins of you know major FMCG manufacturers. So you only need to look at uh, at margins and 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 share prices of uh, of the major American card duopoly to uh, you know to really clear that you know, see that they are. And look at at the UK, for example. I don't want to belabor the point further, but now that after Brexit, uh, within uh, within the UK, uh, those companies are now have you know no longer freed up the shackles of of, in, of European legislation on interchange fee regulations. These cards are now really ramping up the fees in a very significant way, with significant impact on on the retailers in the UK. So I think it's, uh, I mean, these are really I think evidence that uh, that there are issues there that uh, that needed to be fixed. So. But uh, uh, on that note, I really wanted to uh, to thank you. In fact, we're we're only a few minutes after 11:30, but I think it's been a, a very fruitful exchange. I think to you on covering, as you saw, a, a very broad um, number of of topics uh, from the recovery 
to the whole digital uh, competition landscape and we are engaged in, in of course on, on the block exemption regulations on um on the dma on the dsa um i mean sometimes we also you know struggle to try to find a, a common clear position because within retails you have you have platforms you have traditional omnichannel uh, retailers that uh, that have developed platforms themselves you have a number of smes that are using those platforms so so it is challenged but we are working towards trying to provide a, a meaningful input into um, into your work in this area uh, and indeed, the agri food chain is a is a fundamental change. I think you know food retailers is you know for you know about forty percent of uh, of retailers. So I think these are very important. And as you highlighted, and again, thank you for your words of of you know highlighting the importance and what uh, what uh, our sectors and all the people working in in retailers have been. You know, we we call them also food heroes, uh, like the, all the people in the food chain. I think have have ensured the delivery in the last also on the. On the area of payments, which is uh, which is evolving very very rapidly, so I think it's uh, in the whole areas of fintech. So so we look forward to continue working with you and with uh, with uh, your services uh, in this area. So um, I want to also thank all of our participants for uh, for having been on this webinar. Uh, I wanted to also announce two future webinars, which we will have on the 29th of April with Commissioner Gentiloni. Something we will do in partnership with the uh, with the World Retail Congress, uh, 29 of April, and um, and on the 11th of June we have one with uh, with your colleague, Executive Vice President Dombrovskis, to talk about uh, also again you know economic portfolio issues uh, and also trade. So uh, so on that note, I want to thank you all, uh, wishing everyone a, a good end of the day and a good weekend. And uh, Commissioner Margrethe, thank you very much for your engagement. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate being learning to, to unmute. Um, no, I, I know that on some of these issues, I could not be exactly precise because we're in the process of reviewing. And I hope that this has worked as an encouragement for our continued uh, cooperation. Uh, because, you know, we are not better than the inputs uh, that we get. And I know that sometimes things are tricky. But of course, knowing that and working with you allows us hopefully to find the right balances so that together we can make the most of the, of the single market. So thank you very much for this. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.